Well, we're not starting a new series until Easter. So we have two weeks together. We're just kind of doing some standalone deals. But the point of these next two weeks is I want us to really get our heart and mind prepared for uh, an opportunity to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And so even though we kind of highlight that every week, we want to really take the next two weeks to get our minds ready for that. Uh, to prepare to celebrate the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Some questions I think that come around, around Easter time that we really are highlighting is why does it matter that someone died 2,000 years ago? I mean, we, the church celebrates that every year. The church makes a big to-do about that. In churches all over the country, all over the world. But why does that really matter? I mean, why does it matter that some guy died 2,000 years ago? How does that affect, affect my life? Why is that the centerpiece for Christianity? Why is that the centerpiece for so many people's lives? Why is it, I mean, how can that really affect my life today? I think those are all great questions to wrestle with, and this morning we want to take a, a, a chunk of that, not, not addressing those questions directly, but this morning I want to take some time to talk about the ministry of Jesus, the heart of Jesus, the, the mission of Jesus, and all of that then will prepare us for this culmination uh, with Easter. To get us started on that, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 says, if Christ has not been raised, then what we preach doesn't mean anything, and your faith and mine doesn't mean anything either. The point of Christianity really does center around the resurrection of Jesus. And if Jesus came and lived a good life and died and is still dead somewhere, or if he, even if he died and rose again and then died, it's like it doesn't mean anything. If Jesus is not alive in heaven, looking down, leading this universe, then we really are doing a lot in vain. But the Bible teaches us that's exactly what happened. That Jesus is not in the ground somewhere. They're not going to find his bones anywhere around. But he's alive and he leads this universe. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus tells us, I'll tell you, I tell you for certain that if you have faith in me, you will do the same things that I am doing. You will do even greater things now that I am going back to the Father. Jesus told us that because he not only lived, but because he was going to go back and, and be with God in heaven, that we on earth should continue to do the things that he was doing and even do greater things than he was doing because he's going to be coming alongside and aiding and helping us and providing us power. The Bible teaches us really quite literally, that Jesus' resurrection gives marching orders to everyone who follows him, every man, woman, and child. So if you're here this morning, and you consider yourself to be a follower of Christ, and everybody's in different spots, but if you consider yourself to be a follower of Christ, then the resurrection of Jesus really does become and is the center point of your life. It's the center point of your faith. And because of that, we've got then things to do and be about. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, God creates us by each by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we had better be doing. God has plans for us. Because Jesus came and conquered death, there's things for us to do. With that in mind, I want you to grab your Bible, if you will, and turn to Mark chapter 5. It's page 702. We're actually going to start at the very end of chapter 4, also on the same page. Should be a Bible there close to you. Feel free to grab that if you can make use of that. If you want to take that home with you, we'd love for you to do that. I'm going to pull this thing up here where I can see it. My eyes are getting bad, apparently. <laughs> Felt like I was leaning over the whole time. I couldn't, couldn't read my own notes. I think that means I'm getting old. I'm not sure. Mark chapter 5. Yeah, don't lie to me. I mean, it's true. Don't lie to me. It's, not, it's sweet, but don't, don't, don't be false. All right, Mark chapter 4. I want us to start with the last, uh, with 30, verse 35 and following. Um, it says, that day, verse 35, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. So leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion, and the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? So he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now this is not where we're going this morning, so I don't want to stay here very long, but I think there's so much in this little section. If you're going through a storm right now, probably not a literal storm, but you may be going through a storm of your uh, faith. You may be going through a storm uh, with your family, maybe going through a financial storm, maybe going through a relational storm. If you're in the middle of a crisis this morning and you're wondering if God even cares, if God's even aware of what you're going through, then you're exactly in the same spot the disciples were. 
And Jesus was aware, he did care, and most importantly, he had power to deal with the storm that they were facing. So much so that when he did, they were all amazed. And so if you're going through a crisis this morning, I want you to know you're in good hands. God's still there, he's still God, he still loves you, and he's not on vacation. So he's, he's there. Look what happens. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And I want to stop there for just a second and talk about this, because I want you to make sure you understand where it was that he's going to. He says in verse 35, let's leave the crowds and let's go over to the other side. And then verse, chapter 5, verse 1, they landed in this place called the Gerasenes. Now, I've got a map for you here. If you want to go ahead and throw that up, this is a map of what's called the Decapolis. You see those 10 uh, colored areas down below the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is right there kind of in the middle, the little blue splotch. That's where most of Jesus' ministry was based around, now, often on the north side, up on the top side of the Sea of Galilee. But this place called the Decapolis is where all these colored regions are. And it's 10 cities. Deca is a Greek word for 10. So it's 10 cities. And these 10 cities uh, were represented this very dark spiritually place. It might be like if you went to the, the Strip of Las Vegas or if you went to uh, New Orleans around Mardi Gras. I mean, this, this area was far from God. It was a violent place. It was a spiritually immoral place. This is a place that was, uh, the good Christian people didn't go to. And yet Jesus says, let's leave the crowds of people behind and go over to the other side. In fact, even though that phrase was sometimes used to describe the Decapolis, the other side, it was sort of like talking about the other side of the tracks or something in our day, how we would say it. But they were saying, let's go over to the other side. And the disciples must have been confused. I mean, Jesus, why are you wanting to go over to this other side? Why are you wanting to go there? Now, to give you an idea why this place was so far removed from God, why this place was so spiritually dark, if you look back in, in the, the book of Joshua, when God brought his people into um, the promised land to give them their inheritance, God drove out seven nations of people before them and they all resettled out of the promised land area where the Jews landed. They all resettled to this place called the Decapolis. So this 10-city region is those seven nations. The seven nations left the promised land and landed there. And because they had been driven out by God's people, they were from that point on resistant to the things of God. They were resistant to the, the truths of God. And they, their, their morality sort of spiraled off in conjunction. Later on in the book of Acts, chapter 13, Paul again speaks of these seven nations that God drove out, and they drove out of that place, they were no longer in the promised land area, and they drove out to, to this other area, and were sort of on the other side, the people of, of, of the first century would say. So, so Jesus left this very God-fearing area on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, he crossed over through the, through the Red Sea, through the Sea of Galilee, over to this dark Decapolis seven-nation area. These seven nations were spiritual outcasts. It was a spiritually derogatory area. So why did Jesus do that? I think Jesus left the crowds of church people, if you want to say it that way, for this dark area because he wanted them to understand and wanted us to understand that he cares about them too, that God loves them also, that his ministry not only included God believers in Galilee, but also God-hating scoundrels on the other side. That Jesus didn't just come to be the God of church people. Jesus came to be the God of everybody. And so early on in his ministry, this is, this is early on in the, the days of, of Jesus' ministry, he left the God-fearing crowd to go over to the other side. Now look at, at chapter 5, verse 2 and following. I want to warn you, by the way, be a lot more Bible this morning than often because I want to make sure you get this story. There's a lot of details. So if I'm going to lose you, on a typical day, it's today. Today will be the day I lose you. So stay with me, because there's some really cool stuff I want you to catch. Chapter 5, verse 2. It says, When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained, hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him, and night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, or rather the spirit inside of him shouted, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, do not torture me. For Jesus had said, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Verse 11, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. Now this tells you it's not a Jewish area. Jews believed that pigs were unclean and impure, 
And so they didn't, if you're in a Jewish God-fearing area, you would not see pigs. But in this area, they were so far removed from the things of God that pigs were completely fine. In fact, they even worshiped pigs as part of their idol worship in those days, in this area. And so there's a large herd of pigs feeding on the nearby hillside. And then demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. So he gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. So Jesus, Jesus with a crowd of church people, they were having a little revival over there, having a great time. Things were going well. People were getting all excited about the things of God. He says, let's leave and go to the other side. The other side. Goes across through the, the water, had a great storm. Jesus would have known that was coming. He gets out, and when he gets out immediately, he's approached by this violent man, this man who was as unredeemable as you ever want to meet. And, and that is why he came. So this guy, was, this guy was as unredeemable, I think, as you'd ever meet. He was loud. He was obnoxious. The Bible from other versions tells us that he was just barely dressed. He was going around yelling at people, throwing, just throwing a big fit all the time. I mean, just think about this for a minute. Loud, obnoxious, barely dressed. You've not met someone this tough since your last family reunion. I mean, this guy was rough. He was, he was you know, obnoxious. If you grew up in Kentucky, that makes more sense to you than some of the rest of you. I don't, you know, I don't want to... Sorry. Anyway, so this guy was rough, and he was as spiritually unredeemable as you'll probably ever want to meet. And so Jesus comes across, and he meets this guy, and this guy comes up and presents himself to Jesus, and Jesus drives the spirits out of him, and it changes his entire life. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, Those tending the pigs ran off and reported in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. And when this came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were completely afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and about the pigs as well. And the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. And so Jesus did. Now I want you to catch a couple of things here. First of all, Jesus comes over from this crowd. There's a crowd of people loving Jesus. He leaves the crowd. He goes across this water through a great storm, knew that was coming, arrives on this one area to great resistance from the people. And the only person he impacted was this one really bad, undesirable, far from God, obnoxious guy. It's the only guy he impacted. He changed his entire life, but no one else was changed. Now, Jesus, being God, knew the difficulties he would face in getting there. He knew that. Jesus, being God, knew that the people wouldn't accept him, that the only person he would impact was this one guy. And yet Jesus came anyway. There's a whole lot of message right there. Because no matter where you are, no matter what you've been through, God loves you enough to come after just you. And I think it's really important to grab. Because in our day, sometimes we present God and church as if it's for good people or bad people. But Jesus loves you enough that no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter how far you've gone away, that he loves you and he cares about you enough to leave the crowd of church people to come after you. It's really important for you to get that. You know, for you, maybe it's the situation where the, the, that guy at work that drives everybody crazy that you think is so far removed that it just makes everybody nuts. God loves that guy or that gal enough to leave the church behind to go after and try to impact this one person's life. That neighbor that drives the whole neighborhood crazy, that's rough and obnoxious and rude, God loves that neighbor enough to leave the church behind to go after that one neighbor. You know, the part of your, the uncle in your family or the cousin that you think is totally beyond redeeming. God loves them. That ex-husband or wife that just makes you nuts. God loves them enough to go after them. Or maybe it's you. Maybe you feel like you've done too many wrong things. Too many, but you can never be forgiven. I want you to know that when you looked across the landscape of that day, the, probably the most unredeemable person in the entire region was this one guy. And Jesus left the crowd of religious people to go find that one guy. And when that was all that he did, he turned around and left and went away because he had done enough. Jesus loved him that much. Look what happens in verse 18. Verse 18 says, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. That makes sense. Jesus did not let him, but he in fact said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And so the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Now, this doesn't make any sense to me at all. 
Here's this guy who was completely far from God, completely immoral, completely violent and rough and rude and all of that, and he lived in a people that were very similar to that. And so God comes in, God changes his life, God makes him a God follower, and so now he says, let me leave this immoral place, let me go be with you so that I can understand more about God, I can learn more about God, I can be a good Christian person. And Jesus says, no, I want you to stay here. He gets back in his boat, he had done what he intended to do, gets back in his boat, and he goes back over to the other side. Now, I want to get a lot more into that in a minute and tell the rest of this guy's story. But first, let me get a couple of takeaways. First takeaway I think we need to grab out of this whole message is that every life matters. Every life matters. God cared enough for this man that even though he was the only one there to receive, he was willing to go through all he went through for that man alone. And if you're here this morning, you need to know that God loves you that much. No matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, no matter what mistakes you've made, God loves you that much. The Bible tells us that when we come to Christ and we give our lives to God, when He forgives us and saves us, it's not because of any good thing that we have done. It's not because of any righteous deed we've, we've achieved, but only because of God's great love for us. And so if you're here this morning, and sound of my voice, I want you to know that God loves you that much. And no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what bad habits you've got, God loves you and is willing to save you if you give your life over to Him. It's really important to get that. Second thing I want you to understand is that God loved this man enough. His life mattered enough, not just to save him, but God mattered, cared about him enough to use him then and give him a mission that changed not only the rest of his life, but changed his whole environment and neighborhood around him. If you get your Bible, I want you to turn over to another verse with me. We won't stay here long, but Matthew chapter 14, just a few pages back to the left. Because in Paul Harvey's style here, I want to give you the rest of this guy's story. Because it's significant, and it really matters that we get this, especially if you've not always lived the way you wanted to, and your life's not always exactly got the resume spiritually that you'd like it to have. I want you to catch this guy's story. Now, Matthew 14, before the section we're going to read, talks about where Jesus is, again, on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. He's, again, hanging out with God-fearing Jews and, bio, you know, the church, basically. And they were so caught up in his teaching that thousands of them have totally forgot about food. For, for days, they've been hanging on every word Jesus says. They've been following every action that he teaches. So much so that now it's been three days. They're completely hungry. There's no supplies. No one has any food. And so Jesus does a miraculous thing and feeds 5,000 men, probably 10 to 15,000 people, all enough lunch to get them filled up again, and then they all go home. Now, if you go over to verse 34 of chapter 14, page 686, right after he feeds the 5,000, it says, uh, verse 34 says, when they had crossed over, they crossed over again to the other side, just like he did before. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret, the same place. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him, and he, they begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. What a contrast this is from just a few months earlier. A few months earlier, they're all upset about the pigs, all upset about the lost wages, saying, Jesus, get out of this place. You're driving us crazy. And the only one left who was a God follower, the only one left who believed in Jesus was this one very unlikely choice of a missionary who God had saved and turned his life around. And now just a few months, maybe a year or so later, Jesus comes back to this same place and thousands of people come out to meet him. They're thrilled to hear that Jesus is back again, that he can heal them again, that he can impact their life just as he impacted this other man's. And so fast forward a little bit ahead to chapter 15, verse 29. It says, Jesus left there, that one area, and went along the Sea of Galilee to another area in that same region. Then he went up on a mountainside and he sat down, and great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, many others. And they laid them at his feet and he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. They praised the God of Israel because they weren't Israelites. But this other guy, this guy Jesus, whoever he was, he must be something else because he has come and done these miraculous things among us. Verse 32. So Jesus called his disciples to him. He said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. 
I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. So just like the church got all rallied up on the north side of Gal- Sea of Galilee and hung out with him so much so they lost track of food, now these, these people who are far from God but excited about Jesus, they've been with him, listened to every word for three days and lost all track of time. They have no food, no supplies, nothing to provide for them, their self or their kids. And so Jesus said, I want to feed them. And his disciples says, where can we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have, he says. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. So he told the crowd to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish, and when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and afterwards the disciples picked up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. That's significant. We'll talk about that in a second. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children, and Jesus had sent the crowd away. He got in the boat and went to the vicinity of Magadan. Now I want you to catch something here. Jesus comes to this area just a few months ago. Only one guy received Christ. Only one guy was touched. Only one guy was healed. He's a very unlikely choice. Jesus doesn't let him go back. He makes him stay. He says, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell your family. A few months later, he comes back to this same place. And now 10 to 12,000 people are so enamored with the words of Jesus that they forget about lunch. When was the last time you forgot about lunch? Three days they forgot about lunch because they were so caught up in the words of Jesus. Why? Because this one man had the guts to take his story and tell them their story. And Jesus, through the power of God, used this one man to change this whole region of people. God not only cared about this one life enough to reach him, he cared about enough about this one life to use him to change his entire area, the entire region. And sometimes I'll talk to people, and maybe this fits you. And you'll say, man, I'd love to do something great for God, but I just I can't do it because of this. I can't do it because of that, or I don't have this strength, or I don't have that strength, or I don't have this ability, or I've got this bad habit, or I've made these mistakes, or I've done these things wrong. And I just want to say to you, none of you are as lousy spiritually as this guy. None of you. Not a one of you. Some of you are close. But none of you are this bad. None of you are this awful. And yet God used this one guy to change the whole region. And if he can use him, he can use you, and he can use me. Every life matters. Every life matters. Even yours and even mine. And God cares enough about you to save you and redeem you from the mess you're in right now. And God cares enough on the other side of that to use you to change your world. Second thing I want you to catch in terms of a takeaway is that Jesus is not for church people. Jesus is not just for church people. I want, you, I want to tell you the two stories again that we just talked about. Jesus feeding the 5,000 people up, in the, up on the north side of the Sea of Galilee and then feeding the 4,000 people later. Those stories are a little bit different, very similar, but a little bit different. And I want you to catch the differences. Up on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, there was all these God-fearing Jews, the church, if you will. And he was hanging out with them, and they were all so enamored with his teaching. He fed 5,000 men, probably 10 to 15,000 people. And afterwards, they collected all of the leftover scraps. Remember how many baskets full of, of bread they had? Anybody remember? Twelve. There's twelve in that story. Now, if you told the number twelve to a Jewish person of that day, all of them, I promise you, would think about Israel. They were very symbolic in their thinking. If you said the number 12, they would think of 12 sons of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel. So if you said 12, that meant that. And Jesus, who was teaching them about the bread of life, was being very symbolic. It's his way of saying, I am the bread of life. I am your sustenance. I am your life. And here I am amongst the church, amongst God's people, and I'm going to show you that I'm enough for you so that all of the leftovers that are after you've all eaten add up to 12, which represents you, the church. God's people. I am the God of God's people. And so then he leaves that area, and he goes over to this other area where the seven nations had been, this dark, spiritually terrible area, and he goes over to them, and once again, thousands of people, 10 to 12,000, were enamored so with his teaching that they forgot about lunch and hung out on every word. And so at the end of three days, he says, I'm going to feed these guys too. And so he passes out the bread, and he passes out the fish, and all of the bread and fish were out, and everybody had all they wanted to eat. And when they got done, they collected the baskets full. And how many baskets full do they have left? Seven. This area, this dark spiritual area where the seven nations had, had gone away from God and had been dark for years, when he, when he said, I'm the bread of life for you too, all the scraps were picked up, there were seven baskets full. It was Jesus' way of saying, I'm not only the God of the church, I'm the God of everyone else. And you need to catch that this morning. Because Jesus wants you to know, no matter if you've been following God your whole life or if your path has been real rocky, that he is enough for you. He is the bread of life for you. 
And he loves you enough and he's powerful enough to use your life where it's wonderful or sorry. And he can use that life to change not only your story, but to change the story of those around you. And he can even use your darkness to be powerful and reflect his light. The reason this man's story was so bad is because they was so good was that they all knew how bad he had been. And if your story's been rocky, God can use that. God can use your story to relate to other people who think they've gone too far. He can change their life with your story. Now, why does this matter? It matters for two reasons. First of all, for us as a church, we're going through real transformational days as a church. And one of my big concerns as, for us as a church is that we'd get a year down the road or whatever, and we'd be a different group. You know, we'd have a little slick little building and things would be sharp and all this kind of stuff and big crowds and all this stuff, and we'd lose sight of who we are. We are a church that's not just for church people. We are a church for everybody. And so no matter who you are, no matter what you've been through, no matter what mistakes you've made, I want you to always feel welcome here. And by here, I don't mean this room. I mean with us. And we've got to be clear on that as a church. Jesus didn't just come for the good, God-fearing people in the North Sea of Galilee. God came for the scoundrels over in the seven nations And he he loved that man enough to to bring him back and use him to change his whole nation. And he went back again and again to reach that people. And we have always got to be a church, not just for the good God-fearing people on the North Sea of Galilee. We've got to be a people for the seven as well. And so if you're here this morning and your life's a mess and you've done all kinds of things wrong or you're doing all kinds of things wrong now, God loves you enough to reach you and forgive you. And we love you enough to walk through it together. Because we're not just a church for good God-fearing people. We're a church for everybody. And if we ever lose sight of that, we're not just veering away from the mission of Wellspring. We're veering away from the mission of God because Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Second reason this is important is because I want you to know whether your life is spiritually doing great or where you're a mess spiritually, I want you to know there's a place for you in God's kingdom. And if your life's going along good, and you're trucking along right, and your marriage is good, and your life's good, and your spirit is good, and all stuff's good, then you need to know that everyone you lock eyes with is redeemable by God. There's no one too far, no one too lost, no one too broken, and God needs you to, to reach out to them and love them and help them out. But if you're in a mess, if your spiritual resume is tough, <laughs> you've got some junk in your closet, you've got some junk in your life now, I want you to know that this church loves you enough to walk through it with you. And God loves you enough to forgive you in spite of your junk. It's not that he doesn't see it or doesn't know it. He knows it. He sees it. He was there with you when you did it. He loves you, loves you enough to forgive you and heal you and make you new.